Welcome, I'm Ivy Cohn, host of Fuki Cafe. Fuki Cafe is a safe place to talk about challenging topics and issues of our times. It is industrial civilization that troubles me the most, often, and my suspicion is, is that a few thousand years ago, the tribe ceased to push the sociopaths off the ice flow, and hence the patriarchal greed demon has run amok. In my humble opinion, but we are crumbling. Things all around us are crumbling. And there's a deep anxiety that we're all feeling, whether we're conscious of it or not. And sometimes that comes out as anger, anger about perhaps immigration law or gun control or a friend's house being foreclosed on, or anger and frustration at the fact that we have people who are pushing to burn dirty coal. Whatever it is, we need to connect with each other and talk about these things. So today we're going to be taking a look, a clear-eyed look, with courage at some of these difficult issues. I would like to start from the biggest possible framework that we can. And for that I go to Brian Swim, mathematical cosmologist, a good friend and a co-author with Thomas Berry. And this is taken from his Powers of the Universe series out of number five, Cataclysm. Brian Swim. Cataclysm or destruction or really degradation. These are, these are difficult um, ideas and certainly difficult realities, but it is, it's essential to enter into reflection on this aspect of the universe. Everywhere you move, everywhere you go, there's simultaneously this, this breakdown and this building up. It happens every day, every moment, with every breath. And when you walk into a forest, there's a rising and falling of life. Because with every birth, there is a death. But to look at a, um, a larger um, image of cataclysm, we go even beyond the earth and look at the stars themselves. The stars are all part of the rising and falling. And the, the way I'd like to, to think about this with you is to suggest that the cataclysm that's taking place on the planet today, like I said, I, I said before, the scientists have determined that after 65 million years, without a cataclysm at the level of mass extinction, we're in the middle of one. Now, we may have just learned about this in a scientific way, we can measure it empirically, and so we can say, yes, the cataclysm is taking place. But the interconnected nature of the Earth community, the interconnected nature of this Gaian reality in which we live in, communicates in a deep way so that whether or not we intellectually know about the cataclysm, whether or not we know the empirical evidence about the mass extinction, we are in the middle of it. And it permeates even our, I would say, our feelings and our actions and our behavior one way or another. So there's a larger picture for what's going on. I'm joined today by three wonderful people with whom I've had conversations in the past. And so at my far side of the table, I'd like to introduce Janaea Donaldson, who is the producer and host for Peak Moment TV, uh, which is a, a program that has, I think, 200 and something episodes under their belts. Yep. And their tagline is locally reliant living for challenging times. Next to, to Jenea is Tom Grundy, and he is an activist involved in a good many things, uh, also former president of Apple, which is the uh, Alliance for Post-Petroleum Local Economy. Welcome, Tom. Nice to have you here. And Tara Nisa, uh, an, an artist and a filmmaker, uh, as well as an activist in several capacities. But most principally, I would like to call her an advocate for salmon. And it is her two fabulous paintings that uh, you see up here uh, on the set today. So let's just do a little who are you and give us a one minute me. 
So, Jenea. Mm. Who am I? Well, I've been, um, one minute. The, the whole news of climate change um, hit us hard when we started to realize that we were all changing the earth. And what I realized along the way is, in addition to things like how do we prepare for that or climate or for peak oil or whatever, it's how do we hold a kind of center inside that can take that news and, like Brian was saying, realize that we're part of some bigger cycle going on and, in a sense, say, I'm grateful to be here watching, even though parts of this are scary and parts of it I want to, at times, put my head in the sand um, and say, la, 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 and it's not happening. But I feel like part of my calling is to help people take a look at what's happening and how they can not feel helpless. Pass it right to Tom. All right, well, I came uh, from the East Coast about 10 years ago, so as you can imagine, that's a different perspective on this. I'm an engineer too, so a different perspective from about that point of view also. Uh, about, uh, let's see, 2005, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, Apple, who Jenea started before I got involved, brought Richard Heinberg, Heinberg here to speak in Grass Valley. And uh, we saw the flyer for that, and went there. I had al always been curious in the topic of where, you know, where are we going to get the energy, the literal energy to do this that we've been doing for so many years. Um, that was very interesting to me, of course. Really glad I, glad I got involved with that. And right after that, I got involved more with Apple. Uh, one of the slides he had in that show, and I believe this is as close as we can get to duplicating it, was uh, basically showing that you know the road you choose to walk, the sidewalk you choose to walk, can be a cycle between uh, empowerment and despair as you look at these issues more and more. And a lot of people you see in the empowerment phase of it, a lot of people you see in the despair phase of it. And uh, that was really important, I think, to realize that if you're in despair right now, that's okay. Realize that you'd, you're likely going to come around the circle and be empowered, be one of the activists again. If you're one of the activists right now, realize that it's okay if you go down into a, a, a stasis, a doldrums for a while, because you'll likely come back. If you choose to step off the sidewalk for a while to get some other perspective, that's okay too. You may well choose to step back on it for a while. So the perspective he gave in sort of those, in, in that term, in those terms, because all the topics he was talking about and so many more are really impactful <laughs> to say the least mm -hmm. you know you got to keep that type of thing in perspective I think and, and that's really I think allowed a lot of people including myself to hopefully stay in a relatively aware and level-headed space where you can look objectively at some of these problems and numbers that are really daunting without going off the deep end and if you do for a while if you take a while off say I'll maybe come back to the mm -hmm to be active again later on it. Yeah, uh, being compassionate with ourselves. Mm. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is very difficult and demanding and challenging to keep looking at what is so. And so, yes, being kind. Mm -hmm. Tara. Mm -hmm. Well, um, where to start? There's so much. Um, since I'm s sitting here with my salmon paintings, I will s say something about how they've influenced my life. Um, I look at them and I find so much uh, courage there mm -hmm. and determination to live um, despite so many odds that um, I take pretty much uh, you know, a huge key from them mm -hmm. in how to live life. And That's so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't ever really quite thought of it that way, but yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell. So in a nutshell. There it is. All right. <laughs> well, I, um, I guess I should speak just a little quick titch about who, who mm -hmm. I am. Um, I've been a videographer and an editor, um, producer of video for a very long time. I've tried to uh, always make that work be meaningful work. At one time it was around attention deficit disordered young people. And um, around 2000, after having watered my TV and all other media to death in 1978, in 2000 I went, oh dear, I need to be paying attention to what's going on and, and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, just get my 
personal courage in hand and start be, being an activist. So I was kind of late to the game. So this is an ongoing part of who I am and what I do. Um, I'm, I'm a grandmother and, uh, and I'm a nomad. And I'm here with all of you tonight. So one of the more recent things that I've uh, been involved with actually as, uh, as a videographer and an activist uh, was in Bellingham, Washington. And one of the other parts of our set here tonight are these beautiful posters from the poster campaign affiliated with um, Coltrane Facts, which is a website started by um, a couple in Bellingham to encourage the uh, coal scoping process and uh, gathering public comment. And during, during that uh, period of 12 hours that I videotaped, a lot of very interesting uh, bits of information came out, which we'll take a look at tonight, a couple of those clips. But the thing that really hit me is what an example the coal export issue of the Pacific Northwest was of various dots being connected. So it touches on the salmon. Mm -hmm. It touches on the health of the, uh, the wildlife. It touches on the health of humans. It touches on the corruption of big money. It touches on all of these different things. Well, it touches on the dirty, dirty energy when coal gets burned. So just back for a second. So the coal, the whole coal scoping was about what? I mean, what? They, there are five coal export terminals proposed to be built oh. in Washington and Oregon and the coal would be coming from the Powder River Basin in, um, I believe that's Wyoming. And uh, in, in, in fact, the very best thing I could do, the synopsis, and this is from um, a document that was put together by an organization called Deep Green Resistance. Excuse me while I find my notes. Uh, Deep Green Resistance put together a document regarding the coal export, and I, I quote from them. There exists a, quote, perfect, unquote, collision of forces that make exporting coal to Asian buyers a desirable and profitable business opportunity. On the one hand, domestic coal consumption is in rapid decline. As a researcher with Sightline recently wrote, quote, big coal companies are in the middle of a free fall. Many U.S. electric utility companies are turning away from coal in favor of natural gas which in large part because of fracking is available. Mm. There are now approximately and apparently large piles of coal sitting around, their deliveries having been canceled. In short, there is a supply crisis. Mm. Some of the largest coal companies have too much product on their hands and it is costing them. So they are wanting to increase the number of export terminals along the Pacific Northwest, specifically exporting to Asia, and the implications to human life, animal life, vegetative life, water supply. The coal burn in China right now actually blows back and lands on Lake Whatcom, which supplies Bellingham with their water. They've been monitoring that and the various levels of toxins for a very long time. So there are these interlocking and it's an it's, it's an example of what's happening perfect, all over the world perfect example like wanting to drill in the arctic when the when the ice is gone in the summer mm -hmm. i mean the same thing even though it may not happen this year they're working on that it, it, it seems that what we have here is is industrial civilization and the corporations and financial folks that run it are hell-bound if you will to take every last resource and including those that are more expensive or dirtier or whatever. The Keystone Pipeline is another great example of mm -hmm. taking the tar sands from Alberta and shipping them all the way down to Texas to refine them so that we can burn more dirty oil so that we can destroy the planet even quicker. I mean, I feel like that's one of those big pieces of collapse is this drive to just destroy yeah. every resource or, or corporatize every resource we've got mm -hmm. and in the way kill all the ecosystems off. Um, I think Tara has some thoughts here. Yeah. Well, I, I could talk about salmon. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the I, salmon tied directly into yeah. with the coal. 
Be because they're the, they're they're, they there. eat they're the, they eat the smelt, the smelt eat the eelgrass, the eelgrass grass is being impacted because these coal mm. export ships are the largest ships in the world. And they, their bilges, they empty their bilges in the in the bay, and these are bilges filled with with alien, and then by alien I mean not local toxic and, industrial you know, chemicals. Co it, the chemicals from the bilges, the um, the organisms from other water supplies mm -hmm. and other parts of the world all get dumped in. Uh, the, coal, the the fuel that those ships burn is the singularly most dirty. In fact, we we will we will be taking a look at a clip from one Walter who spoke uh, on this topic in a little while. I mean, it's just 900 more ships per year going in and out of the fragile Salish Sea and up around past Alaska to ship this coal to China. And this is tied in with the salmon, Tara. Let me bounce it back to you for a minute. Um, bounce it back to me, <laughs> okay. Well. I'm sorry, I'm going blank for a minute. Well, this, this, the salmon, the salmon are such an integral part yes. of, of what is what is happening everywhere. They're a hub in the in the food chain for one thing. So I can't really talk about what's going on up in Bellingham because I don't have a handle on what's going on up there. But locally here on the Yuba um, and other places in California, we have. I mean, I've I've spent you know, a fair amount of time grieving over what we've lost. Um, and, I mean, what's key in this is we have lost the ability to listen. Mm -hmm. To listen to each other, to listen to the, to the land, the water, to the place we live. And so, so much of this has to do with how, how we're, we're on this planet. and. Uh, I mean, just as an example, you know, we used to, we had salmon that went way up into the mountains here in the Sierras. Um, up, you know, they would come back every spring and fall, and they would spend their time, you know, through a lot of tenacious getting here and come to spawn back up in the ancestral spawning grounds, and um, we basically have not honored them for so long that we're about to lose them. We're about to seriously lose our salmon here. So and Derek Jensen reminds us we're losing 200 species a day. And we should be, I mean, your grief for yeah. me speaks for that grief for the 200 named, unnamed, unseen, who knows what little bacteria, what little fly. And it, it's like, can't, it's hard to comprehend. I'm glad that you have an animal that you relate to. Well, in many ways, the salmon are a huge reflection on how we are as humans. And we can take, like I was saying earlier, um, we can look at them as, as a guide to, to how to live our lives <laughs> in many ways with, with their, their tenaciousness, creativity, um, of, of knowing how to navigate up, you know, through San Francisco Bay. and come up to the big rivers with so many obstacles, yet they're still coming. They want to live, <laughs> you know, they're here. Um, what's keeping them from going all the way upstream is the, the uh, dams. Mm. Mm. So, um, so our e the whole, e you know, the ecosystem above the dams is no longer able to, uh, to have the nutrient that they used to bring back from the oceans all the way up. Um, you know, they used to supply, they used to come in the thousands and supply all the indigenous peoples with, with huge amounts of uh, food. Indeed. Yeah. And listening to each other, or rather the lack of listening yes. to each other, and not, not just the human other, but all of the others. Listening to the salmon, listening to the forests, listening, mm -hmm. really being, and that, that we, have, we have deliberately been separated. We have been alienated. And this is, this is part of what I think during these times of, of collapse and things are changing so rapidly that we, um, we can reclaim. I, I, I'd like to take a look at the, the clip uh, from the Bellingham uh, 
Walter, who was, uh, mm -hmm. is a, uh, a fisherman, is a Lummi Nation mm -hmm. uh, tribal member, and um, he, he really says it better than probably I can. So if we could take a look at uh, Walter. Walter Young here, uh, father, husband, grandfather, great, great grandfather, uh, veteran. I'm concerned about this project because uh, I'm a commercial fisherman, been a retired commercial fisherman, and, and, you, and you people need to know that when they put in the Intelco dock and when they put that refinery dock back in in the 60s, the first victim was the eel grass. Foreign ships emptied their bilges at Cherry Point. When they emptied their bilges, the eelgrass died off, and the largest herring run in the world went away. It never came back. It, it affects all my brothers and sister fishermen because we're losing our resource out there. Another problem I have with this is that those freighters, those extra 300 they want, they're going to burn. Uh, they burn bunker fuel, which is the worst fuel to burn. And the, what comes out of the stacks? Every day out of one ship is, a, is equivalent to 16,000 cars on the road. So we're looking at almost a half million cars worth of extra pollution coming our way. I have health, my health concerns about all of our elders and all of our young kids because we're going to be breathing all of that stuff and I would like that addressed. I would also like the uh, SSA to address where are all these thousands of jobs they're promising. Where is it? Write it out. Um, and all these thou millions of tax dollars that they're putting on TV, that's, that's a lie. All that money is going to be an increased B&O tax for SSA, which goes to Olympia. Very little of it will make it here. I'm running out of time. Don't have a lot of time. Uh, I want to end with this. This is from my brother Cree Nation. It's a prophecy from the 1800s. And they say, when all the trees have been cut down, when all the animals have been hunted, when all the waters are polluted, when all the air you breathe is unsafe, only then will you discover you cannot eat money. Thank you. So that was one um, of many hundreds of people who had two minutes to uh, state what they wanted to see the environmental impact statement including or express their personal feelings, many strong feelings. Um, I, I would like to go pretty much directly to another clip actually from that same uh, event that was in Bellingham um, from a young man who brings us a different perspective. It's not just about the fact that um, the ruination of the environment and the people um, would be extreme. Uh, but also that the very process of the environmental impact statement is corrupt. And the whole project is run by huge corrupt money. So if we could take a look at uh, Dylan. For the record. My name is Dylan Thompson. I'm on the board of directors of the Fertile Ground Environmental Institute, a local nonprofit. Uh, I want to address a impact that I haven't heard addressed yet. Um, it's not really a direct impact, but it's an indirect one that I think is relevant still, and it will be caused by uh, people like myself who do not believe that the environmental impact assessment process itself is legitimate because it's corrupt, um, and who will take matters into their own hands if this terminal is in fact put into operation and stop it using any means necessary, whether that means putting their bodies on the line or physically dismantling infrastructure. Now, this might be a surprise to some of you, but I'm gonna tell you why it shouldn't be. Um, we've had an environmental movement, a modern environmental movement for the past 40 years. If we put the beginning at Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, published in 1962, we've had environmentalism in this country for half a century, and yet every living system on the planet is in decline and the rate of decline is accelerating, and there has not been a single peer-reviewed scientific article that's been published in the past 30 years that contradicts that statement. What's happened over and over again is that environmental impact assessment is basically just environmentalists tutoring developers and industrialists on how to develop and industrialize in a more friendly way. And that is not, that's not possible, okay? Things are getting worse. Where are the migratory songbirds? Where are the salmon? Where are the pronghorn antelope of the West Coast? There are less and less forests, less and less fish in the oceans. 
We should not be surprised that people are about to take more militant actions when these things are being proposed and built. So I wanted a matter of public record that I, for one, will not come out and speak against people who take matters into their own hands to stop these things. Thank you. So we have yet another perspective, um, laying our bodies on the line to stop some of the industrial civilization's devastation. And as that clip was playing, I noticed that um, Tara, Tom, and Jenea, all three of them were going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so Tom, let's hear from you. What were your thoughts there? Well, I think he's, uh, he's right on. Uh, here in California, I mean, we have the California Environmental Quality Act, which is, you know, for a lot of things, uh, the strongest line of defense in the country, uh, probably a lot stronger than the National Environmental Protection Act uh, for certain things. Um, and there's, you know, politicians on the left side of the spectrum, like a certain governor, who are just itching to gut it, to, mm -hmm. to say we c people are using CEQA, the Environmental Quality Act, uh, to slow down these important developments. And what an interesting statement to make, mm -hmm. you know? Well, of course they are. I mean, it, that statement is so loaded. Slow down, the implication being it's going to happen anyway, so why are you standing in the way? And slow down implying the only thing you hope to achieve by even having this conversation, even engaging in the CEQA process, is, you know, just to, to be an obstructionist. Mm -hmm. I don't think people want to be an obstructionist. Uh, and it, when I've spoken on groups like that, I don't want to be an obstructionist. I mean, these people just want to stand up for their opinion, stand up for their way of life, uh, while acknowledging the fact that, yes, we all use metals from the ground, we all drive cars that burn gasoline. I've taken more than my fair share of airplane flights. Uh, and we all have computers. And we all have computers, and mm -hmm. those things are just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. And we all, we all buy groceries at grocery stores, and we live here in Grass Valley, Nevada City, which is 60 miles from the nearest shipping port. Uh, the list goes on. But despite all those, you could call them hypocrisies, that we have to acknowledge, you know, it's our, it's our duty, our, our moral obligation, if you want to say, that, uh, to push the rock in the right direction. Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you can either push the, wrong, the rock in the wrong direction, or you can sit down and let it roll over you, or you can push it in the right direction. And you can find out the most intelligent ways and the most well thought out and peer reviewed ways to help push the rock in the right direction with the uh, with the biggest payoff, or you can you know join uh, you can be less analytical about it and more from the heart about it. Those two are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. I don't want to imply that they are. Uh, all these all these outlets you have to push the rock in the right direction. You don't necessarily need to be focused on. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to push the rock over the hill you know, over the other side so it falls down. It's just a moral obligation to push it. I think what you're, what you're describing right down here on the grassroots level is a real um, manifestation of the big myth that America is built on. America is built on this myth of progress defined as, you know, more, faster, more technology, more accumulation, more stuff, and, 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 you know, that's the American way, which is now spread out to be the multinational, the global way. And to say, wait a minute, I don't want a coal. We don't want coal. I mean, stop the coal. Let, them, let it sit. Or, mm -hmm. or let's take the dams down so the salmon can come back up. Or the millions of actions that we need. Mm -hmm. But every bit of them fight against what we all think America or life is about, which is this narrow definition of progress and accumulation of material things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not, I mean, America certainly is a, a, a blazing example, but it's Western industrial civilization, which has yeah. now, of course, become glo globalized and is in, in, in impacting, sure. you know, and wiping out. China is adopting their version a of it. A absolutely, absolutely. Um, Carolyn Baker is a woman who has, we're, we're going to touch on her works a little bit more later, but she, in a recent article, quoted David Corton, who's quite an analyst, and has spent, I believe, a lot of his 
time and energy around economics. Actually, he wrote the book, When Corporations Rule the World, and, and yes. meaning, here's, here's what we've got. Look at, look at the world when corporations rule it. And that's so. exactly what we're facing. So it, and it's a current affairs book. Basically, even though you read late 90s, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's current 90s. affairs. Right. He saw it coming and he's seeing it deepening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so in, in one of her, Carolyn's recent articles, she quotes David Corton, um, who is, amongst other things, uh, author of The Great Turning and An Agenda for a New Economy, in addition to the book you just mentioned, and uh, is an editor, I believe, for Yes Magazine. And so his article was entitled, From Empire to Earth Community, which is a thread here that we are all coming back to. Mm -hmm. uh, that rebuilding, that relocalizing that, that your peak moment is so much about, uh, the work you've done, the work you and I have talked about mm -hmm. in, in terms of building the connections between us again as humans and being authentic. So David Corton says this, this was uh, printed in Yes a Magazine article recently. We face a defining choice between two contrasting models for organizing human affairs. Give them the generic names empire and earth community. Absent an understanding of the history and implications of this choice, we may squander valuable time and resources on efforts to preserve or mend cultures and institutions that cannot be fixed and must be replaced. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with him. And in a sense, part of the, the David, David would have, he, he, he would get rid of the Wall Street Mafia. He would talk about real wealth, which is our fresh water and our salmon and our mm -hmm. soil that is being despoiled by mm -hmm. ag industrial agriculture, and our health, which is being destroyed by industrial medicine. Um, he would ask to say, what is real wealth? And it isn't that paper stuff. No. Which Walter, our Lummi Indian, exactly. said at the Beautifully. end, you can't eat money. And, and our friend Mary Nelson, who was part of the inspiration for this show, Mary always reminded me early on of what we're doing is the platform humanity is standing on, we are burning it. You know, we, we humans are burning that platform, not realizing that we are standing on it. That metaphor of we're destroying the water and the oceans mm -hmm. and the atmosphere and, and everything. It's like, and he, he's right, we may, it may be too late, right. or there may not be a lot of folks left, or a lot of humans left, or a lot of species left. Mm -hmm. because we because we have institutions that are running the show so well to and, do otherwise mm -hmm. and in and in running the show they have created a number of what are termed positive feedback loops so industrial civilization has resulted in 10 right off the top positive feedbacks and I'm going to run through this and I think Tom actually you sent me a, a link to uh, an article on methane Recently. So this is the climate change. So this is this is the climate change piece, and this was uh, from Guy McPherson, who's done. A, you know, he has taken a lot of the data and analyzed it and correlated it. And uh, you might be able to give a little bit more of the background of Guy. He's he's an, his he's a, a professor emeritus from University of Arizona in environmental studies. Mm -hmm. So he understands mm -hmm. the big picture, and he actually, when he got the whole picture of this, he actually tried to have, you know, speak up about it and was asked basically to leave. Yes. Because the establishment doesn't want to get things shook out. Oh, it's bad for business. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes, yes. yes. Right. yes. Very, right. very, very right. bad. Very bad Students might not want to come. I mean, it, uh, yeah. go ahead. Very, very bad. So I'm just going to whip through this because I really think that, the, that um, m many people are not aware that we have some really big feedback loops in place. Methane hydrates are bubbling out of the Arctic Ocean that was cited in Science 2010. Warm Atlantic water is defrosting the Arctic as it shoots through the Fram Strait, January 2011 from Science. Siberian methane vents have increased in size from, are you ready for this, less than a meter across in the summer of 2010 to about a kilometer across in 2011. Methane, by the way, is like some ridiculously large number of times worse than yeah. greenhouse gases. I've heard 200. Yeah, two, so two, two, three hundred, huge. huge number. 
Uh, drought in the Amazon has triggered the release of more carbon than the United States in 2010. And, and, and that was a turnaround because usually the rainforest is where we're sequestering That's carbon. Right. So have it turn around and give it. It's like we are on. We I mean, are this is the big, wrong track. Big trouble. Uh, peat in the world's boreal forest is decomposing at an astonishing rate. Mm. Methane is being released from the Antarctic as well as from the Arctic Ocean. Russian forest and bog fires, this is very interesting, are growing. They're just ongoing bog fires now that are not stopping. Uh, the cracking of glaciers accelerates in the presence of increased carbon dioxide. That was October 2012 out of the Journal of Physics. Exposure to sunlight increases bacterial conversion of exposed soil carbon, thus accelerating thawing of the permafrost. I found that one very interesting. Mm -hmm. And the last one, which is, by the way, in Guy McPherson's humble opinion, the only one that we can do anything about at this point in time, the Arctic drilling fast-tracked by the Obama administration during the summer of 2012. That's the only one we have any control over. And those nine or ten are all accelerations. I mean, we have uh, of those, yes. those um, the symptoms of the climate change. And part of what he's saying is um, w this is beyond control. It will continue to accelerate and feed on each other. That's the positive feedback loops. He doesn't hold out a lot of hope here. No, he doesn't, actually. Um, and, and we're going to get a little yeah. bit more into that after a bit, but I, I kind of like to jump back to the salmon, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. um, the salmon uh, not only, of course, has their central role in the food chain, yeah. but also as a, an incredible symbol um, for spirituality. I have a couple of clips from the coal scoping events, um, well, one in particular that I want to play, uh, and actually uh, actually, I think what I'd like to do is play you these three clips back to back. So while our um, director digests that for a moment, uh, the first one is from a Swinomish woman who came uh, to speak at the coal scoping event in Seattle, which was at the Seattle Convention Center. There were a total of 4,000 people there, 2,000 in each room. And um, she spoke quite eloquently regarding the salmon. The next clip that you're going to see uh, will be our dear Tara, actually, here at a local event uh, where her, uh, five of her paintings on the salmon were displayed during the Wild and Scenic Film Festival uh, this past year. And the last is Derek Jensen and an excerpt from uh, a film by, oh dear, um, was it Ensiv? Ensiv. And Siv. Uh, yeah, I'm, my mind is gone. Franklin Lopez. And so Derek Jensen, excerpt from a film by Franklin Lopez, which um, wasn't this one. I think I think Franklin based it on Derek's End Endgame. Endgame, Probably. which is a two volume um, set of books. Mm -hmm. So in rapid succession, let's take a look at these clips and then we're gonna come back and talk about the salmon again. I'd like to call our last dignitary, please, Deborah Lakanoff with the Swinomish on behalf of Chairman Brian Clattersby. Please state your name for the record. Good afternoon, Deborah Lakanoff representing the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community on behalf of Chairman Brian Clattersby. Uh, we send greetings from the mighty Skagit River. A fact today, one river produces all six species of wild salmon and their tributaries. That's the Skagit River. The Swinomish people will protect the Skagit River and its resources just as it will stand next to any tribe and any organization that will protect its watershed from white cap to white cap. We are the people of the Salish Sea. To my fellow trustees, thank you very much for being here. Our treaty resources are being destroyed every day. What will remain for our future for generations if we continue to sell our future for a mighty dollar? With this in mind, let me address our federal trustee with respect. The Army Corps Engineers and EPA is here as the coordinating agency. This is what's taken off the Army Corps' website. You acknowledge the wisdom that tribes bring to the table and how our programs, projects, and activities can enhance their input. The United States Constitution specifically addresses tribal sovereignty. We are the supreme law of the land as our Indian treaties stand. We will act to fulfill its obligation to preserve 
and protect trust resources and to consider the potential effects of the Corps' programs on natural and cultural resources. You will work to meet trust obligations, protect trust resources, and obtain tribal views of trust. I will go on and on about what is on the Army Corps Engineers website reiterating to you what your trust responsibility is. We remind you of that trust responsibility today and tomorrow for generations to come. The Swinomish people want to ensure that we all live a healthy lifestyle, that our human health is protected, that we are able to say the mighty salmon are still here hundreds of years down the road. With that, thank you from the Swinomish tribe. Hi, I'm Terry Hicklin, and I'm here today with an amazing local artist here in Nevada County, Miss Tara Nisa. And we're talking today for the Fuki Cafe. And Tara, tell me a little bit about your work. Well, I, I could say I have a relationship with fish, yes. Yes. And tell us about your relationship. Really, how long has it been going on? Mm, the relationship started about 25 years ago. Um, spending a lot of time in California on streams and rivers, up and down um, Northern California in the coastal range as well as in the Sierras. And that started with restoration projects. Well, the salmon started about a, a little over a year ago, talking to me in visions. Uh, it, to describe it would be very difficult. That's why I've painted this. Mm -hmm. Coming to me in wide awake dream, um, dreams, if you can call them that, I don't know what to call them, but I, I was inundated by imagery from the salmon. Um, and after a while, I started thinking, okay, this, this is significant. I need to start painting them. And so this is the beginning. These five paintings are the beginning of telling their story and what's going on on our local river here at the Yuba River mm -hmm. and the Chinook and spring run and fall run and how difficult it is for them because of the dams that are here but they are a fighting species. They continue to come and bump their noses against the dam, and it is very intense for them. Every day that passes, the world is in worse shape. The sad-looking man you see on the screen is Derek Jensen. His books deal with topics such as surveillance, child abuse, the environment, and something he calls civilization. They're thinking of raising the Shasta Dam in California. And the reason that Feinstein gave, Senator Feinstein gave, was um, it is Californians' God-given right to water their lawns. You know, there is no way to argue with that, um, <laughs> except with explosives. If people would have brought down civilization 100 years ago, people in the Pacific Northwest could still eat salmon. There's going to be people sitting along the Columbia 50 years from now, and they'll be glowing, for one thing, but they'll be starving to death and they'll be saying, I'm starving to death because you didn't take out the dams that killed salmon. And those dams were used for barging and for electricity, for aluminum smelters, for beer cans, so. Thank you so much for bringing this up. So there we have three clips back to back, each of them slightly different all about the importance of salmon. Hmm. Hmm. So, do you have any uh, thoughts? Well, I, yeah, I have some thoughts about <laughs> how we relate to each other, and so much of this has to do with relationships and how we go about honoring each other. So much of it is, is it just doesn't exist in this culture. We don't, we, it, like you said, we were just, we're all just about, it's, it's about just taking what we can and making money out of it <laughs> instead of looking at it in an honorable and, you know, as if, if this, as if it really mattered how we treat each other and, and what we're doing on this planet. So, yeah, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to, uh, to go about and knowing what to do next. Mm. Yeah, sad aspect of it is that um, capitalism, and I mean, not just American capitalism, but the advent of you know currency that has gotten the population to bloom so much, in one form or another, 
it doesn't have space on the balance sheet for pollution of the commons, destruction of the commons, mm -hmm. uh, destruction of someone else's individual lifestyle. Those things don't appear in capitalism. They don't have space. And when someone brings them up, someone else who's concerned about protecting the shareholder value, protecting little Timmy's college fund, all the good things, in quotes, that come from shareholder value, uh, someone else will speak up and quickly point out that's an externality. That, mm -hmm. that is something that we cannot quantify and it's dangerous to, to try to quantify it. It's something that other people have to bear. In short, it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. That's what capitalism mm -hmm. says. And we're all riding that train. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly not to say that you know, we're all proponents of it or that we're doing it's being done as smartly as it could or that there's not too much corruption in it uh, but it's you know I, I think it's important like we're talking about the uh, listening to each other is also listening to and understanding the motivations of the people who will protect little Timmy's college fund at all costs mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. by protecting the drive for shareholder value at all costs so there's some combination of personal greed and corruption and altruistic protection of Timmy's uh, college fund that defines what drives capitalism. And all that together, mm -hmm. it's terrible that it doesn't have space for the things that actually matter to human beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when um, you were speaking, Tara, and it s s ties into what you're talking about, because I find myself getting incredibly frustrated and, and, and angry. I, I mean, I you're right I'm you know I'm in this culture you say to the fish how's the water what water they don't they can't tell the difference but I, I'm going whoa I'm in this like sea of capitalism and greed and I don't like it and how can I disconnect and and I feel like the salmon butting its little snout against the dam mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know I, I can't break the dam with my snout any more than the salmon can break the dam with their snout but together we could do some dam removal, perhaps. <laughs> well, we do have a local organization here who's, work, who's been for years now working on our local dam removal, but uh, the Corps of Engineers really stands in the way, and they, they just don't really think they want to take that dam out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even the smaller dams that are below the big one. <laughs> well, uh, well one, one of Derek Jensen's comments back in one of his many books regarding dams um, is that if we took a, even the dams that are just over three feet tall, that there are so many of them, if we took one out every single day or ten or something, it's a ridiculous number, that we wouldn't be able to take them out in, in, in 500 years. Mm -hmm. There's that many small dams, and then mm -hmm. there's the big dams. Just in our lifetime, we really have taken over, humans have taken over the planet. I mean, cheap energy has let us increase the population yeah. in the last 100, 150 years. So, you know, we have enormous population. We're an overshoot. This planet cannot mm -hmm. take care of what all the humans want, much less just what they need. I mean, either way. Right. Either way. Um, and, you know, and the whole, all the Western institutions, we're back to industrial civilization, that, that corporate entity that we, we humans have granted that a life. We also yeah. could take it away and not grant it a life. However, at the moment, it's at the top of the heap running, running so much. Mm -hmm. And I really laud the work of people like Thomas Lindsay who are trying to work back at the local level. I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. we're going to break this. It's the, I mean, it's not going to come down at the level of the governments. They're just pawns of those who are really running the show. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Obama has no surprises. He's just a continuation of Bush, who's a continuation of Clinton, et cetera. So we're not going to break it there. It's going to be down here, mainly, I think, disengaging. You're right. We can't. Our little salmon beaks aren't going to break the dam, but but a few people with some explosives might, as well as organizations like Circle who are trying to find legal ways to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. And it is that full broad range. It's it's and, and we're a little bit ahead of the conversation, but it, who cares? It's a conversation that can go as it wants to. These these issues 
cause us who are looking to get very, very frustrated. Of course, they're so scary that a good number of people can't look. Mm -hmm. It's just so much safer for them to stay in denial and not look. But we're looking and we get, you know, f I mean, the grief factor, the rage factor, the outrage. And then what do we do with that? How do we, you know, if, if I didn't have a few friends with whom I could be completely real and have these kinds of conversations, I would have lost my mind a long time ago. So, you know, the salmon also, you know, they're, they're such an important piece here, Tara. The salmon also, for me and for many, 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 especially the indigenous, are representative of spirit. Mm -hmm. And that is part of what has been taken away from our human experience by patriarchy mm -hmm. and industrial civilization run by patriarchy is our relationship with each other, our relationship with the universe, our relationship with planet Earth, we have been isolated. And that, I think, is one of the things that we can do in the face of this. Give each other safe space mm -hmm. to grieve, rage, be in that despair. I, I'm, I'm going to ask our uh, camera people um, if you can hold that really, really level and they can get a close-up shot of this. Because I think that this, yeah, level that out, Tara. Good eye. Thank yes, you. So, you know, we've got, we've got despair down here, and we can all relate to despair. We all have something mm -hmm. in our lives right now that is causing us to despair. And it's not like you're in either, you're not either here or here. It, it's a little of all of it all the time, but predominantly you're going to be in one space or the other. So, you, you know, here you are in despair and you're going to circle around to empowerment. That comes principally, in my humble opinion, from the encouragement and dialogues and being authentically human that is, is where we get our relief. It's where we get our, our ability to, to, to cycle back up into empowerment again and do something. Whether it's, whether it's disengaging, I don't use credit cards. I use cash. That's a tiny little disengagement. It's not huge. I'm still caught in the culture, as you pointed out. But it's something. Janae. I was going to say that the, the, when, when we really first got what was going on with climate change in 1990, from James Lovelock, who gave us the Gaia hypothesis, is like, I was, I was, and then he updated it, just you know, whatever, a decade ago, and I with the, with the climate change, and Robin and I, my partner Robin and I, were in such grief. I felt like for three months, I was mourning. I was mourning when, when Lovelock says we will be fortunate if by the end of this century, this 21st century, to have a few thousand humans. Um, who are able to to mate and have children is like in the polar area only, and it's like I I could not take I couldn't take I couldn't be with that. It took months of that, mm -hmm. and in a culture here that doesn't really encourage us to feel, much rather distract us and keep us busy and thinking and and staying on the rat wheel. Um, and and it was it was only as we moved to something like doing the peak moment shows, meeting people who who are on the side of life, you know, who are mm -hmm. growing their gardens and making mm -hmm. their houses out of carbon plaster mm -hmm. and 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 finding ways to step down or step away from industrial civilization a little, a little, that that it kind of moved me out of being paralyzed, which is why I wanted to mention Joanna Macy's book Active Hope kind of was a nice mm -hmm. change of flavor from how most of us think of hope. You know, you know I hope the salmon will come back. <laughs> um, you know, I hope, I hope the, the snowpack will come back to California. It's passive. Somebody else will do it. <laughs> and what she's saying here is no, no. Real hope means it's active. It means you, others, are doing something. And I think that's the empowerment side mm -hmm. of, of things. Mm -hmm. And then... You know, then you have something that feeds you, feeds you some energy. Mm -hmm. um, I, 
Either of you have Well, I, I just that there's a sense of responsibility. When you feel responsible for something, whether it's your child or your pet, you know, it gives you that connection and, and mm. that, that relationship you have with that being. It's the same thing when we're walking on this planet and that I'm getting back to the listening and how we have those relationships with each other and 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 those that are around us including the the water and the land and I'm gonna go right back to holding things in a sacred way and if we did that we would have we would be have this strong sense of connection and responsibility here and then what do you think would happen you know if we really felt if we really got it like yeah. our ancestors yeah. probably did this is sacred and my life depends on this yeah what do you think I, I'm you know what would that look like I mean what kind of things would we see happening hmm. sorry to put you on the spot <laughs> but it's like it's like I, I'm saying that yeah. because we can hold that in our hearts right but I think we would we, we, yeah, we would still we would take our, our little small town here would have a sense of yeah, we can do this. We can become independent and, and be local and, and work within our own system here and support our, our each other in, this, in this, this little tribe we have, which is our town. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one place to start. And that can happen in a city setting, too. You know, there, there's, there's places within the city where people are working together on these things. There's great examples of that out there. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I definitely agree with your point that um, it would be hard to move yourself back on that cycle from the state of despair to the state of empowerment if there weren't others around you doing the same thing, uh, helping, helping lift you up, helping, helping push you up. Um, that's human nature. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a great part of human nature is, you know, you have these, uh, so societal shifts and you know shift in society wouldn't that be great so that we're not as concerned about the dollar and we are as concerned about things we can eat but uh, you know if you don't have help from a little you get by with a little help from your friends mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that song wasn't just a random collection of words and it was around long before they came up with the song so that's the central part to all of this I mean it, you don't have to be immensely analytical looking at what is the precise best way to push that rock in the right direction because I really really want to get it to the goal and if I can't get that rock all the way to the goal where it tips society away from capitalism then I don't want to waste my time you can't focus on that type of thinking I mean if you have a million people helping push the rock in the same manner you are it's going to do a lot better than if you're the only one working on it Absolutely, and and we've uh, up until very recently, and I'm, I think in a lot of parts of the country, probably still people who who would like to be having these kinds of conversations can't because they literally don't know anybody else. They're feeling completely alone. Now that that's changing. There's a lot of resources of information on the internet, and there are people who are gradually, courageously, like getting this much of themselves up out of the sand and looking around a little bit. But without having that, it is very lonely and very despairing. And you're right, you can't get out of that despair and back up into the empowerment side without comrades, without people of like mind and heart. I'd say you can, but it's a whole it's different challenge. Very, <laughs> yeah. it's very, yeah. very difficult. I mean, you have to be so dedicated and so focused. I like what Guy McPherson said in one of his recent articles. If, and this is regarding denial, about what is going on. Um, if you knew a meteor was coming and was going to hit the earth, uh, would you want to be knowing exactly when that was gonna be happening or not? Most people don't wanna know. And Guy said, I wanna know exactly when it's coming because I wanna be looking at it completely courageously head on for what is so. That's a paraphrase. But and he's curious. I mean, that's part of his nature. He's curious. I have had to stop since I don't, since I would want to, I'm on his ship. I mean, I'd, I'd want to know when it was too. 
But I have grown in my capacity to have compassion for those who are denying it. Right. I am not trying to change my family a whole lot, a little bit, a little bit, but I'm not hitting them with this kind of information mm -hmm. all the time because I realize that for many people, there's, there's a whole body of people who are just working as hard, as fast as they can to just even keep their heads above water, and I can't pay attention to this. And there's a whole lot of other people who, for whom it says, I know I can't do anything. You know, this is not the act actors. So I think I'll just stay doing what I'm doing. I don't want to hear this. Mm -hmm. And I have compassion because it's a safer place in a very unsafe world. Yes. We don't have a safe culture. I mean, the native people that we're talking about had, had the safety net of one another, plentiful food. Nobody had locked it up. They could go hunt it. They could go fishing. Mm -hmm. We don't have that kind of security now. Right. Mm -hmm. And so fight, you know, part of coming back to the hearing that you're talking, listening is how do we re-tribalize ourselves? Mm-hmm. That is that rely is on each other. Right. I think that's a very key key piece, and that's that's something that you know, in little ways, as much as you can in in your community, if you can do it at a larger level, fine. But it really comes back to where you are mm -hmm. in place. You know. I mean, when we don't have any more petrol for our cars, and we're riding bicycles, many blessings, Tom, on your bike <laughs> He's riding. our biker. He's our yeah. biker. You know, I mean, and I thought, are you kidding me on a bike? I don't think so. I mean, I just, I just, you know, maybe a donkey. You know, that could work. <laughs> um, Derek has something to say, actually, about what we need at this time for ourselves. I'm referring to Derek Jensen. Uh, author of Deep Green Resistance, which is not just a book, it's also a movement, rapidly growing. Um, but he has a clip that I would like to actually go to, and it's, it's his words set to music, and then we're going to read it. An excerpt from Deep Green Resistance by Derek Jensen, Eric McBay, and Lear Keith. This is a book about fighting back. The dominant culture, civilization, is killing the planet. And it is long past time that those of us who care about life on Earth began to take the actions necessary to stop this culture from destroying every living being. And we need courage. The word courage comes from the same root as cour, the French word for heart. We need all the courage of which the human heart is capable forged into both weapon and shield to defend what is left of this planet. And the lifeblood of courage is, of course, love. The songbirds and the salmon need your heart, no matter how weary, because even a broken heart is still made of love. They need your heart because they are disappearing, slipping into that longest night of extinction and the resistance is nowhere in sight. We will have to build that resistance from whatever comes to hand, whispers and prayers, history and dreams, from our bravest words and braver actions. It will be hard. There will be a cost, and in too many implacable dawns it will seem impossible, but we will have to do it anyway. So gather your heart and join with every living being with love as our first cause, how can we fail? How can we fail with love as our first cause? Mm -hmm. Sweetness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hope. Yeah. yeah. So courage, courage to step out of denial, courage to deal with our grief, and our rage. I tell people, go buy cheap pottery, smash it, it'll do you a lot of good. <laughs> uh, with our fear, it's terrifying what's happening right now. You know, how, how do we deal with that when it comes up? You're hoping we have answers? Well, I'm just, you know, I mean, we all need to be sharing what other t little tips and tricks and things that we have, you know. I mean, I find myself sometimes just like so tensed up and then I go, okay. You know, and I do these little, like, physical things to de-stress my body and center again. Well, I, I think a big part of uh, keeping centered, if you will, is uh, 
keeping active, keep pushing the rock, find out more ways to keep pushing that rock in the right direction with others on your own if that's what it is too at the same time. Uh, it, it's There's been a lot of paperwork, a lot of literature on the actual um, psychological value of green movements. Mm -hmm. And on some of them there's been analysis of well, maybe that's the only tangible value of this movement is psychological support. And if that's the only right. tangible value of a certain movement, that's great. That's huge. If it, as long as it, you know, enables people to focus on what are the other right ways to push that rock in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's huge. Yeah. It, it, is, it is huge. And, and it brings up a point that, that we had uh, touched on lightly um, in a pre-conversation. And that is holding the opposites. Mm. We have such divergent extremes that we're dealing with. I mean, in the one moment, I'm just overwhelmed with grief and rage at what's happening. And there's dams, and there's coal terminals, and there's, you know, mercury, and blah, blah, blah. And at the same time, I had a songbird this morning that was singing for an hour and a half without stopping. And I, I was just filled with joy and you know encouragement mm -hmm. you know and and I know that we have some I books couple, here. I, I want to um, let folks know about Carolyn Carolyn Baker has written a couple of books and her emphasis has been the the psychological and spiritual part and she's recognizing that we are going to have to live with holding that cognitive dissonance, that tension of a culture that says, buy more, buy more, and, and the increasing unhappiness because of that. So her books, what, Navigating the Coming Chaos, a handbook for inner transition. What's the other one? Sacred Demise, Walking the Spiritual Path of Industrial Civilization. And what, what, her, what her gift is here is, first of all, giving us permission to go through the dark emotions, giving us permission to to grieve and to rage and to and 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 all the stuff that our culture says shove it under the under the rock, mm -hmm. um, and and then kind of build your inner bunker. What is it that brings you a peacefulness? What what is it that centers you? For somebody, it's going to be going for a walk. Somebody else, it may be a quiet time. For somebody, journal writing or or singing or. So there's lots of, what I really like about what she's got here is it doesn't feel religious, mm -hmm. but it does feel spiritual. It feeds spirit, feeds our, our, li our aliveness. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 as you notice, I was, there's a lot of, <laughs> she also has some very beautiful poetry in there that I think speaks to that. So um, that, that has been, you know, she says, build your inner bunker, you know, your, your fortress of safety and and I think the place we can hear, thinking of what Tara's saying, hear again the yeah. earth, the beings. Yes, I was going to say, it's a taking that time to do that, um, to, to really listen to each other, you know, to be present with one another, um, whether that's human or, or, you know, going out. I spend a lot of time on the river. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to be close to water for my balance, personally. Mm -hmm. That's what it, um, and then I just hold that wherever I go. If there's a moment I just put myself, you know, where so I'm getting stressed out by something, I put myself back into that being with water, and that'll center me again. It's you know. interesting wording with your, uh, your personal bunker. Um, it's, it sounds a little bit like there's danger in that. Right. It's, it's I believe it's important to build your personal space, but the hazards of staying forever inside your personal space are huge. I, I think if you, you just, obviously, if you just go out and have the perspective every now and then that we're all in the same boat. I want to find this little safe personal mm -hmm. space for myself, but then I want to go out and appreciate that we're all in the same boat, especially when you look at some of the bigger collapse scenarios. Yeah, I, I had trouble with her using that, that metaphor. It's like, wait a minute, what am I doing with this wartime kind of, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, that, and that I realized that in some respects that is true. You know, the bombardment of this culture is, you know, part of a retreat into mm -hmm. one right. safe, quiet mm -hmm. space away from that bombardment the metaphor kind of fits, though, though, though what she's not saying is that's not everything. That if we come back to the place where we're going to say, be with what's going on, be with our grief, be with our outrage, 
then then from here we'll have the energy to go join each other and, and do things together, I think. I think that's her I, the notion in this. Did yeah, yeah, exactly, that's it. And then, you know, actually looking at the fact that we're all in the same boat and looking at the fact that, you know, your neighbor three houses down who you've never spoken with before, hmm, there's probably some things that could be done to help them deal with it better and help them find the ways to push the rock in the same direction. And that whole domino effect of, mm -hmm. of you know, looking how you can bring more people into the fold or help bring more people into the fold is motivational itself. So it kind of, and the puzzle is interconnected, that kind of looking at how other people are also in the same boat mm. helps you to expand back out of your bunker when it comes time to do that. Yeah. It's very interconnected. Very interconnected and, uh, you know, ceasing to be separated is, is a note that I had jotted here. Yeah. Because we have, as, as a culture, the, um, the, the corporate powers, the industrial civilization motif has deliberately separated humans. And, and kept them isolated, and kept them not just isolated from each other, but from themselves, which is what you're talking about, and you're talking about, and, and we've all mentioned, to be able to be comfortable and okay with just being with myself quietly. Mm -hmm. Not doing anything, not, not... How radical. I mean, that, it's, it is, it's, it's radical. radical. in this culture. You know, I'm not, I am a human being. I'm not a human doing. And f if I can get very quiet and comfortable and okay with myself, I'm going to be able to then not be intimidated or afraid or put off by being there for my friend Tara, Tom, or Janae, or any of you when you're in the middle of a meltdown. If I, I'm, I can just be okay with me and have that relationship with myself, mm -hmm. then I am more able to be present for you right. when perhaps you're at the bottom of that despair empowerment cycle. And then at an another moment in time, I may be ready to throw in the towel. I'm at at down in despair, and, and Tom's grounded, centered, and feeling pretty strong, and he can create a safe place for me to just fall completely apart because we are gonna fall completely apart intermittently as we go through these times. They're just that intense. I wanna speak for the people who may not be as comfortable with the feeling stuff, who may not. Yes. Because I find a lot, and this is, I'm speaking with my Peak Moment TV hat on where we're meeting people who are just taking that sort of gnawing worry and they may never say a word about it, but they're doing community gardens uh, with, their, with their church. Mm -hmm. they're, they're working in the earth, there's a, the most popular shows we have are about people doing their backyard gardens. And I think it's giving them the connection to the earth, right? Mm -hmm. It's also going to feed the family. It's also going to teach the kids about bugs and water and soil and, and eating something that's alive with real nutrition. So uh, I think that for many people that is enormously healing. The therapy comes in a lot of different that's right. forms. So I think similarly for people that are, so what I look to that, that makes me, in, encourages me, is that people are sort of just doing things, sort of almost sometimes on an instinctual level. They probably couldn't talk to you about peak oil and maybe climate change is now hitting. But they'll say, regardless of that, I just want nice fresh tomatoes. And then, they, and then they help their neighbor next door who doesn't have extra. And then they start sharing a little. And they, next thing you know, all the folks on the street, many on the street are sharing the prune. Yeah. That's the kind of positive feedback loops right. that I'm wow. seeing that people doing. So, yeah. Positive feedback in the, in the best of truly sense positive. of truly positive yeah. action. Right, right. It just uh, makes me think it's time for a well-pointed cliche to use the carrot and not the stick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, because that, that's a perfect example. Looking at just the, the stick would be using the negative reinforcement, mm -hmm. illustrating to people, look, you better care for the planet or else this is going to happen to you. It's, it's blackmail, really. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Use the bribery instead, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, grow your garden so that you can have all the great benefits you just talked about and more. Um, right. illustrate and if the, the trucks benefits. stop rolling, you know, it, eventually as we build that, the trucks drop rolling for a few days to the grocery stores. Well, that's okay. 
I have some extra beans stored or you know, hmm. we'll share it with my neighbor next door. That's that's actually this woman here, this this is this woman is a soccer mom, Kathy Harrison. And what I loved about her attitude is she says on the back, don't be scared, be prepared. And it's not just nice. about having extra extra food and water and stuff on hand for her family. She's gotten the neighbors in and they have canning parties together and drunk, you know, so it is, it is from that little seed of doing something for her family, it's grown That's to great. the neighborhood to feel more secure. So, And all those little connections begin, I mean, we, the, the name of the show is Connect the Dots, Systems and Collapse, and the flip side of that, in, in fact, let me see if I can find it here. Mm. No, but I'll paraphrase. The flip side of that is when we connect the dots of our humanity and begin to build that community at a very real local level again. And part of it, of course, is disengaging from the system because those folks building the gardens are disengaging just a bit from mm -hmm. industrial civilization. And I think that's one of the most powerful things we can do. And you talked about resistance. You were talking about you don't use a credit card anymore. A couple of years ago, a whole bunch of people said, I'm going to move my money. Somebody did a movement, right? Move my money from the big banks yeah. over to the little local credit unions and banks. And it made, it, I mean, the impact was felt by the big, the big ones. Hmm. And I see those kinds of acts of just sort of pulling away from, disengaging from. For me, a big part of that is the, in food. For, it's, it's, uh, local food, thank you, and as much as possible. I think also thinking in relative terms instead of absolute mm. terms is critical. If, you, if yeah. you focus on absolute terms, meaning I'm part of the system, I'm not going to be happy until I'm completely separated from the system. Until I'm absolutely. Impossible. Yeah, if, if you focus on that, you're going to have a little bit of a difficult time <laughs> coming out of that despair <laughs> part of the cycle. Exactly. But if you, if you look at all the relative terms that mm, you can make, I, I'm, I'm reducing the amount of engagement with the, with the system. Mm. You know, mm. I, I'm reducing my carbon footprint in this area. I'm reducing my water consumption in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, you increase or you reduce. Th those are doable, tangible, quantifiable, <laughs> and motivational if you want them to be. Mm -hmm. uh, if you mm -hmm. focus on the absolute, that's a problem. <laughs> well, it can, it can really trip you up. Yeah. I mean, it just sort of... Well, it's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible, right. I love, I love the story w about going, you can't put a man on the moon. This was in the 60s, and Kennedy says, we're going to put a man on the moon, and he's like, this is not possible in 62 <laughs> or 3 or whatever it is. And so the story is, the first person you put in the building is the guy who says, you can't do it because we don't have a propulsion system that will do it. And so you get a team working on that problem. And the next person shows up, and you can't do it because humans can't be out, you know, in gravity. It's like you have people start working on that. And we bit by bit by bit mm -hmm. by bit by bit sought work on it. And so that's what you remind me of. It's like you, you do the little, and then you do there's something else that's possible, and something else. Those are the things we've been talking about right here are within the context of small actions within our personal lives at a local level. Mm -hmm. And most people, that's where they can be pretty comfortable. But when we have things like coal export terminals with billions of dollars and extreme corruption behind the game, or the Excel pipeline, or golly gee, just, you know, Nestle in water in India. I mean, I mean, the list is so humongously long. There are some individuals who are able to go out, like the fellow in the pipeline, great shot. He's actually in the uh, credit roll. You, you all can look for him in the credit roll. He's sitting in the XL pipeline with a gas mask on his face. Wow. Um, who are taking their bodies and putting them physically in the way to stop things from happening. So we have tiny actions that can be taken in our personal lives at a local level. And we have larger actions that can be taken at a very personal but a bigger level. And we have everything in between. And then we have people who are out there blockading pipelines. Uh, and we have little old ladies who are sending money to organizations who are supplying food to the people who are at the pipeline location who are getting water and food into the guy in the pipeline. 
So there's all these different places where we can be disengaging, resisting, and, and that, that leads me to a clip that I very much would like to share with um, our viewing audience from Guy McPherson's work. Mm -hmm. And um, Janae, I appreciate you reading this as we look at uh, our number 11 uh, folks there in the control room. We are skipping a couple things and jumping right up to uh, Guy McPherson's uh, number 11 in the lineup. So um, when that, there we go. This is an excerpt from A Farewell to Arms that was posted by Guy McPherson on Transition Voice last November 2012. When we choke on our own poison, we'll be taking the whole ship down with us, spewing a global blanket of radiation in the wake of collapse. Can we kill every single species on Earth? Apparently, we're willing to give it a try, and I will not be surprised by our success at this omnicidal endeavor. I'm letting go of the notion we'll retain even a fraction of 1% of the species currently on Earth beyond 2050. But I'm not letting go of the notion of resistance, which is a moral imperative. It's clearly too late to tear down this irredeemably corrupt system and realize any substantive benefits for humans or other organisms. And yet, I strongly agree with activist Lier Keith. The task of an activist is not to navigate systems of oppressive power with as much personal integrity as possible. It is to dismantle those systems. So there we have some powerful words. Chew. That's at the far end of the spectrum of how we can resist this culture of destruction. And everything in between counts, from mm -hmm. growing that tomato to blowing up dams. It's all in there. And part of the essence for me in this whole conversation, and particularly what Guy was just saying there in those words, thank you for reading that, is reclaiming our authentic, our authentic humanity, being real with ourselves so that we can be real with each other, so that we can build community again. That's probably one of the largest points of resistance to uh, the dominant culture that we could do. What does that mean to you? What does authenticity mean? Being congruent with how I'm feeling inside and what comes out of my mouth, for instance. Uh, taking the time to just sit and listen to the songbirds and just be with that and then because I'm being just with that something will come sailing in that's like oh wow that's a solution to something I've been struggling with because I gave myself a quiet moment to let that come in uh, being authentically human is sitting with somebody whose family member is in the process of dying and wailing with them. It's not my family member, but it's my family member because we're all part of the living universe. Those are some small examples. Mm -hmm. Interesting mm -hmm. word, living downstream. Uh, that gets used a lot. Uh, downstream, for a lot of people say that, it doesn't necessarily mean sit back and ride the train because there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, it's, it's interpreted that way incorrectly quite a bit. Mm -hmm. What one person considers downstream, another person may observe as why are they fighting so hard. You know, the person who's with the gas mask inside the Keystone XL pipeline, he may be doing what he considers downstream. I cannot just, he may be saying, I cannot sit by and just watch this. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us are saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, for him, the most downstream action, most authentic, comfortable action is going inside there with gas mask. So different interpretations of authenticity too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that we're, we're coming close to the wrap up for this conversation, but this is one conversation amongst many conversations. And I encourage all of you who have been watching this program to 
make and take the time to have these kinds of conversations with those people in your life with whom you can and laugh and cry and rage and throw old pottery if that's what it takes. <laughs> because reclaiming our humanness and our ability to be there for each other is really the foundation of growing the tomatoes or going and sitting in the pipeline and everything in between. It's our relationships with ourselves and with each other and we are made out of the stuff of the universe. We opened with Brian's Swim and we're actually going to go out with another clip from Brian's Swim. Um, and he talks in this clip that we're going to wrap up with about synergy and mutually enhancing relationships. And that's what we're talking about here, are the mutually enhancing relationships. So here's what I'm going to say. We're going to listen to a little bit of Brian to encourage us to be synergistic with ourselves, with each other, with the salmon, with the with planet. The, the more than human world. With the more than human world, yes. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> um, I want very much to thank you, Janae and Tom and Tara, for joining me in this conversation. I hope we can do it again. And mm -hmm. I know that you're all in your own rights out there having conversations like that, like this one. Yeah. No cameras rolling, but we're all having these conversations. <laughs> um, and, you know, I encourage you to hold the largest framework that you can. And, uh, and when you can't, when you're down at the bottom in despair, be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's okay when you're in despair. Just say, I'm in despair. It's being an authentic human. That is being an authentic human, exactly. So we're going to take a little quick listen to Brian. Then we're going to have a few URLs that you might find useful. Some of the uh, authors that we've mentioned here, certainly uh, Jenea's Peak Moment um, URL is included. You can go to Fuki Cafe on YouTube and follow um, some of the other programs. This one will be up there shortly at some point in time. And on that note, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for convening okay. this. Yes. And thank you all for watching. And let's go and enjoy a bit of Brian again. Bye, all. The challenge of our time is for synergy to operate, at least in part, through conscious self-awareness. But a simple way to talk about it is it's a, it's a planetary form of the human. And so we're moving from an industrial civilization to a planetary civilization. It is um, based upon the notion that we really are fundamentally Earth, Earth community. The first quality of a synergy person is amazing optimism. <laughs> oh, one last thing. <laughs> the, um, this movement into a, a deeper synergy involving all the components of the Earth community this movement is going to take place. We don't know the time schedule, but it is what Synergy has done throughout the whole history. We align our own personal energies with this ancient movement by participating in the birth of a society where the fundamental organizing principle is mutually enhancing relationships throughout all levels of the society. We're aligning our energies with this cosmological power we're calling synergy.